Technical Writing for Inspectors, Module 6, What Makes a Bad Report? Instructor, Gary A. Pace, PE, CWI, Katy, Texas, TexasWeldingEngineering.com. Okay, so our learning objectives. We're going to talk about how to write a terrible report. So before we figure out how to write a good one, we're going to kind of look at some things that we don't want to do. So we're going to talk about confusing or indecipherable document titles wrong or missing low quality images, flowery and emotional languages, um, circular cross references, no um, table of contents or index, an unusable index if you put one in there, and then five common mistakes in writing technical documents. That's what we're gonna cover. So how to write a terrible document? Well, first one, a confusing or indecipherable document title. Next one, wrong, missing, or low quality images. If we're putting images or graphics in there, we want to have a match up and we want to make sure everything's dialed in, that everything matches what we're trying to convey to the reader. Flowery or emotional language. We don't want to get into flowery prose like we're writing a poem or maybe a short story for, you know, a horror novel or something. We don't want to do that. Flowery and emotional language out out the window on this one. Circular cross references. We don't want to refer to one place and then come back to another place and then circle back around. And then if we if we're gonna if depending on the length of the report, we want to have a, a table of contents and possibly an index. I I don't use an index too often. Sometimes I do, but Sometimes I don't, but we'll touch base on it. And an unusable index if we have one. So we want to avoid indecipherable document titles, things that are just insane, that don't make sense. So instead of, you know, an example of this would be instead of calling your document Mark 24 User Manual, whatever the Mark 24 is, use something like this. The M24X768 set 5.3 rev, blah, 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 OPS, blah, and use that as a document title. That, that just doesn't make sense. So you want to use, for your document title, have it make sense. And there might have to be additional information other than Mark 24 user manual, but try and make it so that a person looking at it that doesn't know what this M24X-76 set 5.3 rev 4.468 OPS is, they just know it's a Mark 24. So also under the confusing or indecipherable document titles, you know, you don't want to use something like the all comprehensive inclusive inspection report for the inner unit condenser and pipe weld inspection functionality. You get the picture. You don't want to have a, a document title that is that long and unwieldy that just doesn't make any sense maybe you know there's cleaner ways to do that you know and this is a mess there's no other way about it this is a mess we don't want to name things like this we don't want long-winded titles when we're naming our document reports because it just doesn't do any good for anybody involved short to the point and if we need extra information, we'll put it in there, but we're not going to get um, over the top like we did on this situation. Um, you know, there's different ways to develop naming t conventions. You know, short but meaningful. Keep the name short and meaningful. Um, maybe put in unique identifiers, case number, project title, model of the the uh, you know, whatever you're working on, piece of equipment, location of the report that you're writing, you know, on, you know, inspection report from Maine and Monroe or something, something like that. Unique identifiers. Be consistent when you're naming your reports too, especially in a, if you're on a project, you know, let's say you're on a long-term project for two or three years, you probably want to be consistent in naming your reports. And these things can confuse you later on. You might have known when you wrote this what this report is about, but a year later somebody asks you about it and wants a copy of it. Good luck finding it. Um, sometimes you can put the revision number or the 
version when it's appropriate, that isn't an issue. That makes sense a lot of the time. Ensure the purpose of the document is quickly and easily identifiable. So you want to put that on there so that the person can understand what they're reading or whether they need to dig through this report or not. Okay, so we want to be careful about images. Images, graphs, any of that kind of um, visual information that we want to convey to our readers. So you don't want to skip figure numbers from 11 to 13, so there's a gap in there. Leave your readers wondering what happened to number 12. Um, don't leave the spot for figure 12 blank and then a note in there that reads not applicable or to be determined. We don't do that. If you got to renumber, renumber. Um, don't insert a figure that has nothing to do with, let's say we're writing a report about structural steel, and then you just have a giant photo of a nuclear power plant or a car or a birthday cake, whatever. Make sure that our figures have to do with what we're writing about. Make sure that it makes sense. Don't insert photocopies of photocopies of photocopies into a report that we're writing. Don't do that. You know, something that's just so low quality that we can't read it. That doesn't help us out at all. Sometimes you might have to reproduce, um, you know, a, a wiring diagram. You know, go to the, go online or go to a, download some kind of, uh, there's options out there. We'll cover it later, but sometimes you're going to have to be a grown-up and redo a drawing or a sketch or something. So instead of using something out of a manual from the 1940s, you might have to reproduce it and put it into, you know, a modern format. Um, make sure the readers are going to be able to connect the text to the images that you're referring to. Don't put all your uh, images on one page and then 27 pages later, you're going to reference those uh, images. You don't want to do that. We don't want to use flowery and emotional language either. You know, for this example, you don't want to write like, for the love of God, first close valve A by turning it the appropriate direction. Once you do that step, you need to move on to the next step. Close valve B with loving tender care. We don't want to break anything, do we? Are you being a good worker? Have you checked the pressure gauges in step two? Oops, sorry for not mentioning that earlier. If the pressure gauge is super high, like totally over 300 PSI, something bad is going to happen. Four, once you shut off both of these valves, important valves, without blowing us to kingdom come, we can take a break and grab a Pepsi. We don't write like that. There's way too much flowery and emotional language in there. If we're writing a technical report or instructions, we don't write like we're writing a children's book. We we keep our adjectives very tight, close, um, pointed in the direction that we need to have them going. We don't want to get flowery and emotional language in there. Um, you know, and when we use emotional, imprecise, and creative style for our documents, we don't do that on procedural steps or any kind of technical documents. We don't write like this. We try not to use cliches. Cliches or figures of speech are terms that have no concrete meaning and can affect the tone and professionalism of a document. Cliches should be avoided in technical writing. Um, sometimes I use these, but you got to be careful how you use them. Um, kind of like using nuclear weapons or something. I don't know if that's a good answer, but you want to be very careful on how you use cliches. Some examples would be water under the bridge. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you're a native English speaker, you know it means that, hey, we don't worry about that. It happened in the past, right? Well, we don't include that in here. Writing is on the wall. Well, the writing is on the wall means that, well, we should be able to figure out what's going on from the past context clues that we received. Um, easier said than done means a task is difficult. Close the deal means we're going to finalize any transaction. We don't use this kind of stuff. We don't, we try and avoid circular cross references too. Circular cross references are uh, a series of references where the last object 
references the first resulting in a closed loop. So if we go say, you know, we put something on our report that says see page 10. And then on page 10 we say see page 12. And then that sends us to 14 and then 14 sends us back to where we started. We don't do that. We don't have circular cross references. Try not to do that. That is bad. Um, you don't want to send your readers on a wild goose chase to drive them crazy. This could happen if you, uh, you know, use circular cross references. You don't want to have a report, especially a lengthy report. And I don't know where that. I usually anything over probably three or four pages. If I'm writing it, I try and have a table of content index. Man, I, I generally don't throw one of those in unless it's really a big, big report. But just realize that those are things we need to do. But, you know, uh, if you want to confuse the readers, don't include a table of contents or an index. So then they're going to have a difficult time finding what they're looking for. A lot of these reports, you don't read them like, a, you don't read them like you're reading Lord of the Rings or some kind of literary piece front to front to back. You, you open it up, you look for what you're looking for, go in there, extract that information, and move on. So a lot of times, table of content is super important because your readers are just going in there, scanning it, looking for what they want, and then getting out. Um, yeah, and force them to flip through a printed manual um, or search for keywords if they're online. You know, This will really make your readers crazy. So we try not to do that. We try not to force them to flip through a, you know, a big thick printed manual or search the keywords. Give them a little help. Put a, t a table of contents or an index together for them. Okay, so here's five common mistakes in technical writing documents. You know, writing before you're thinking. You know, starting to write before you plan your document, and even, you know, thinking about who the audience is. Who am I writing this to? You know, writing a document addressed to a bunch of business leaders in your company that might not have technical expertise is going to be a completely different document than if you're writing it to a bunch of PhD structural engineers, two totally different audiences. Um, you know, providing too much detail when you write a technical document. But then on the flip side, being too vague, not giving enough uh, information. So we kind of look for that. Um, I'm going to use a cliche here, the Goldilocks zone, where everything is just right. We're trying to find that nice zone where we can um, have a lot of detail, but not too much. And then, you know, using first person when third person might be a better choice. I've harped on that. And confused sequencing of the report. If you have the introduction last and the conclusion first and your the body of your report is all... Uh, mishmashed and confused, that could be problematic. So these are five common mistakes in technical writing documents. Okay, so summary. How to write a terrible report, confusing or indecipherable document title, wrong, missing, or low-quality images, flowery and emotional languages, language, circular cross-references, no table of contents or index, an unusable index, and five common mistakes in writing technical documents. That's what we covered. Questions. Gary A. Pace, P-E-C-W-I, Katy, Texas, TexasWeldingEngineering.com. Got any questions or comments, contact me, and I'll try and see what I can do to help you.